Hi, I'm Greg, supervisor of crude clay production at Amico. We are proud to supply clay for your studio or classroom. This episode is brought to you by Amico Brent. Find Amico clay glazes and equipment at your local Amico distributor. Today's episode is brought to you by the Rosenfeld Collection of Functional Ceramic Art. The collection exists as an online resource for research and inspiration, featuring photos of thousands of objects made by over 800 artists. The images are high quality and can be used with no permission required, making them a great resource for students and teachers. To find out more, visit rosenfieldcollection.com. Welcome to the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler podcast, featuring interviews with culture makers from around the world. This is Ben Carter. I'm going to be your host. If you'd like more information on the show, please visit our website, talesofaredclayrambler.com. Welcome back to episode 473 of the podcast. Thank you all for tuning in. Today on the show, we have the first in a two-part interview with renowned ceramic artist and educator Linda Sikora. We talk about growing up in Canada, her path to being a potter, and how the ideas of service, storage, and display shaped her recent exhibition, Darkening Ground, which was up at Frayer and Contemporary in June. Linda has been teaching at Alfred University since 1997 and has been an integral part of educating a generation of artists at the institution. To find out more about her work, you can visit lindasecora.com. Before we get to this interview, I wanted to thank the folks that donated to our podcast. We are listener-supported, and I could not make this show without the generous contributions of folks like Connie Norman and Judith Oppenheimer. If you'd like to get involved yourself, you can do that at patreon.com slash redclayrambler. Without further ado, we'll get to the interview. Let's start talking about where you're from, because you're a Canadian and you're from Saskatchewan, is that right? I was born in Saskatoon, yes, and then uh, my father was transferred literally every three years. Um, So I lived in quite a few provinces. Then finally we landed in Alberta where I went to high school. And that's uh, in Calgary, Alberta. And that's actually where I was introduced to ceramics too, because the art, they had an art uh, room and they had one art teacher as is typical. It was a large school though. There was a huge population that was from the city. I took a bus there. There were also, you know, all the kids from uh, the nearby indigenous kids that were bused in. And the teacher was trained in ceramics. So she had put a kiln in the space uh, and really emphasized that because that was her passion. So that was just kind of, um, you know, a stumbling into of sorts. So that's where that all started. In that whole area, how would you describe, for people that aren't familiar with Canada, with the province of Alberta? It's the foothills uh, of the Rockies, uh, essentially, and into the in between the foothills of the Rockies and the prairies, right? So it's on the west um, of the Rockies. And my grandparents immigrated from Czechoslovakia. They came into British Columbia and to work the orchards. They were escaping everything going on in Eastern Europe um, at that time in the later 20s. Uh, Mid twenties, I guess, and um, and then they ended up in the coal mines, uh, in a small town that's actually in Alberta, but it's you know in the Rockies. It's a very short drive, two hours from Calgary, and that's where my father was born. He was the first born in on this continent, and then of course I'm second generation Canadian now. So, what was your experience with craft like as a child? Do you remember having? handmade objects around you? Is that a part of the family structure? 
Well, uh, yes, in the sense that my father was a, a woodworker. And I think if he would have had his druthers, that's what he might have done. But he instead, you know, joined the army before he was of age, as kids do to escape their home home and it was it was a pretty intense uh upbringing living in a coal town being one of eight um the families were large then they were immigrant families the my grandparents never did speak english and there was a burden especially on the older kids to really be upstanding you know they had to learn the language they had to learn the culture they had to you know separate from everything uh that came before that and really sort of carry that weight so he ended up uh, joining the army and then he ended up training with the RCMP. And so he was on a path that wasn't going to, you know, take him anywhere back to that. But he always kept a wood shop and uh, would make things. He made me, you know, toys. He made me um, small hutches to put all my dishes in, for example. And he made small pieces of furniture for the household. So he was very much uh, a maker and he was meticulous uh, as a individual. Uh, it was There was nothing more beautiful than seeing him dressed up in his red serge going to a formal with my mother and her long gloves and her hair and uh, beautiful dresses. And um, it was it was really, there was that spec spectacular sort of uh, presentation. So that was, you know, perhaps the most uh, exclusive and formal and aesthetic sort of treat that we got as, you know, sort of four very born, born very close together rugrats. But um, that was that was what was in my house in terms of of what was made and what was lived with. So his career was in the mounted police. That was that was his life career. Yes, it was. He ended up working homicide primarily fairly quickly. Um, and it was intense in a lot of ways. I remember living in Winnipeg uh, when he was. We were transferred there. He was transferred there, and we all went there. And we lived. We lived in a house near the barracks. And us kids would go down on the weekend. He'd be working and had to, you know, had us in tow because he had watch over us that day or something. And we would escape wherever we were supposed to be and snoop around. And so the other thing that he did which is sort of this uh, related to craft, I guess. He photographed crime scenes. So before he was running homicide, he would, and we would sneak into the dark room. It was, I mean, I still have images in my head, a couple of them. And um, they, uh, so there was, there was that too. And um, he, he loved to take photographs. In fact, I have a beautiful collection of old photographs. He took of my mother, he took of the family, uh, black and white, and then some of the early ones that were hand tinted. So he really did uh, have an eye uh, for, you know, just composition and aesthetic. And um, of course, there was lots of occasion for that in terms of the formal celebratory part of what he was doing professionally. And then there was this other side of that that was so intense. And I, I do know it haunted him uh, for his whole life. I can imagine. And, and and even you guys, this sense of like going to your parents' work and wandering around, like I did that in my in my father's work as well. But when you stumble into a dark room and see, I mean, that was probably the first time you realized like, oh my God, my dad works with death. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we got in trouble <laughs> for that. Uh, but yeah, that was, uh, yes. And then, you know, ironically, you know, kids play these games and, you know, they chase each other, they hunt each other down. They could be as, as sort of innocent as tag or as, you know, sort of naughty as sort of, you know, being robbers and villains. Um, and we would run around the uh, grounds of the barracks and play those games too. Where there were, we were quite a mess of you know sort of wild kids on that. There was three duplexes, there were three or four. I think there were three duplexes, and and each of them had you know a handful of kids in them. All the officers were fairly young and just transferred in and things like that. So from your experience in that that high school class or in that, that local class, how did you end up going? Because you went to Halifax, right, for undergrad? Yeah, I did. And and so um, from high school, you know, I, <laughs> I come out of high school and you're sort of looking around, you know, what's next? So I went to community college and I registered for uh, math, 
anthropology, uh, ceramics, and um, a literature course. And that, so I, so I picked it up right away, again, not thinking. And it was maybe through that um, that I had uh, the notion that this could be something because I had energy connected to it. A friend of mine at the time had a, um, had relations in Nelson, British Columbia, and we would go out there um, and visit her grandparents um, and hang around. And there was a school of art there, the Kootenai School of Art. And in fact, I got connected to that and went, ended up thinking I should simply enroll. So I took this pathetic portfolio. It was a, literally a cardboard box full of barely any fireware, but a bunch of bisqueware that I made in this community college badly on the <laughs> wheel or built or whatever. And sort of why I remember sitting in the office with this box. And I don't know if they were desperate for students or not, but <laughs> I got in. And um, and so I went to I went to school there for three years. It was an unbelievably cool place to go. Uh, I lived with musicians. One of our roommates was the stand-up bass itself, the instrument. <laughs> and um, we had a really amazing time. It was, um, you know, a small town, a small community. Everybody worked hard and uh, took their discipline seriously. And it had this social context of music. Uh, as well. So that was really great. And that was a three, I believe it was a three year program. And I think I had a diploma after that. Um, and at that point, or during maybe my third year, I had met Walter Austin, come ac across him, became more aware of the whole scope of possibilities and made an application to uh, Nova Scotia College of Art and Design. And Neil Forrest interviewed me and looked at my work and let me in. In between going between British Columbia and Nova Scotia, I did take a studio in uh, Calgary, Alberta. So I went back to Calgary. I moved in with some friends. I worked restaurants. It was the oil boom. There was a lot of money floating around and a lot of other things. Uh, but I bankrolled enough money to actually pay for that education and buy some equipment, you know, a basic kiln and wheels. So that all those tips uh, just sort of catapulted me into that. And then from um, um, Nova Scotia, of course, you know, with Walter, you're exposed to the whole possibility of what can happen. And uh, so there was that break, I guess, that was sort of uh, that break between the BA or the first diploma and the BFA. And then I went, you know, in a sense, Nova Scotia was the beginning or sort of the prep work for graduate studies. I went straight from Nova Scotia into the University of Minnesota then. So did you come into NASCAD and then do four years or did you come in as like a junior? I came in in the middle. Yes. Yeah. So they granted me, uh, I'm trying to recall, I did one and a half or two years there. I think I did a full two years there. Uh, so I came in, yes, and did a junior and senior year. That's right. And then had an exhibition in the Anna Leonones Gallery with uh, Catherine Finnerty. So that was super great. So you guys were in school together at the same time? We met there, and Joan Bruneau uh, was there, and Lisa Naples was there. So these were important people, obviously. And it was, um, it was a Lisa was in the grad program there. The grad program was fairly particular. The history of Nova Scotia College of Art and Design, which you probably know, is it was very connected to the scene, uh, the painting in New York at the time, and. And the grad program was very separate from the undergrad program. So the undergrad program, in so many ways, is like what we do at Alfred. It's really sort of materials and tools and teacher intent, teaching intents. And their grad program was almost like a seminar. And it was, you know, even though the students in that program would be using areas to work in, they were really a separate group. Um, and and Lisa did work in our area. And I think that might have been more unusual. She had a place with some of the seniors. Uh, nonetheless, um, it was, uh, its structure was particular, the way those programs were separated when I think back on it. When I think of NASCAD, it is such a home for terracotta because of Walter and and because of the clay, because there is actual 
was it Lance Clay? I can't remember the name of yes. the yeah, the Lance Clay there. It's beautiful terracotta clay. So how did you end up not being a terracotta potter? Because all the <laughs> all those people you mentioned are all terracotta potters. <laughs> yeah, they really are, aren't they? <laughs> Good question, Ben. <laughs> Uh, it was going on, and I did do some terracotta, actually. I think that we also had Freddie Fredrickson come in when I was there to build some higher temperature kilns, and I think the real reason was Sarah Coot. So Sarah Coot had finished her graduate work at um, Alfred, and she took a teaching job there. Neil Forst was maybe... He was there already, maybe just a couple of years. And so I really connected with her, you know, and she was working in a higher temperature. We had a, a soda kiln out in the courtyard outside of the Morris Tea Building, which when we fired in the winter at some point in the firing, um, maybe close to sort of mid you know, a mid high fire range, we would have to start hauling buckets of hot water out of the studios to pour over the propane tanks to activate the propane to get it to cone 10. <laughs> so <laughs> that, was, that was part of our slog. But um, but it was really Sarah. And Sarah was a huge influence. I remember some of the assignments she gave me gave us uh, as seniors. And so um, in the first semester of our senior year, we were all sort of jammed in this very small space. It's pretty amazing. Um, Cindy Lee was another one who was a student there. And um, she, we had to make a vessel in the portrait of, after someone in the portrait of somebody and I picked Virginia Woolf. And so it's so funny to think about that now. You've opened up this whole space I haven't thought about for so long because I just this summer decided to reread all this Virginia Woolf. So I've just been doing that, just did the waves, a room of one's own, and now I'm just finishing to the lighthouse. So I'm going through this piece, but she gave those, and those assignments of course necessitated that we begin to really address uh, anatomy um, through methodologies of throwing and building. And so that was a big influence. And of course, her work was thrown and altered. And, you know, later on, we had all sorts of, you know, thrown and altered slice and dice, nick and tut, cut and paste, you know, we had all these ways of talking about it. But, um, you know, that was an impact too, because it takes you out of the round and it started to get me more interested in complex forms, whether the form was complex through uh, construction or complex through uh, surface. So that pulled me, uh, pulled me in. And uh, it's, it's a maybe an exercise to contemplate why that was, because I haven't traveled back and thought about that um, before. But of course, Walter too would, you know, get us all to load up in vehicles, and we would drive out to New Brunswick and fire wood kilns. And I have this great image of him on top of this climbing kiln, dr dropping uh, a stoke of a, a stick of wood <laughs> down through a top peep with this devilish expression on his face, which he's so capable of, and the flames licking up, you oh know. So it's that was another part of what he did. So he was he was pretty versatile. That and bringing in the chickens, you know, <laughs> into the classroom in cages so we could model them. So there was all of that stuff. Um, but it was great. Yeah. <laughs> Well, one of the things that NASCAD does up until, I think they're still doing it, but there was a real interest in craft history. And that's really a Canadian pursuit in a way that I don't think it is in the U.S. Like the, it is not, it's it's hard to compare the U.S. to Canada because there's, there's so many different schools working on different uh, curriculum. But at NASCAD, there was a serious craft history connection. So did that affect you? And what was your experience with that? Yes, I think so. And that was Walter. Yeah, he, he was really the one that did that. And it's so interesting you asked me that right now. I'm just looking around right now because just this morning I pulled out this book by Peter Dorma. And so I remember being at a book fair in uh, New York and picking it up um, because it's a bit, it was hard, it's uh, out of print and it was hard to find. But he, um, yes, he did. And he he really believed in sort of this, you know, really moving into understanding work and materials through people and place. And um, a la what he did at Nova Scotia, as you mentioned, with the clay there. But that was a big part of it. So, um, and, and I think in that too, you know, along with sort of that background, 
that pedagogical foundation, which is certainly something that influences my teaching, um, is also, you know, just really um, developing a sense of, you know, a sense of integration, how these objects were integrated into culture. And, and I feel like that's just such a charge, especially these days, because we're often, you know, exposed to so much uh, detached imagery, right? Just decontextualized imagery. And so that was essential. And he would also have these fantastic gatherings every Thanksgiving, every Canadian Thanksgiving, which is a bit earlier than the American one. Um, and most of us would just stick around because we were all from other places. So he'd have us all over to his house and put out these amazing spreads of food on this wonderful service ware. And uh, just uh, we would feast together on that day and sort of enact, you know, that other part of, you know, why it is we make pots and care about the domestic space and see significance in it. Um, so, so context, I mean, context is a big part of what I continue to think about all the time. And certainly that was a seed planted in Walter's pedagogy. Well, I want to kind of take a sidetrack from your biography and talk about this idea of context and then aesthetic. So okay. in our in our current time, there's a lot of talk about appropriation and looking to looking at other cultures taking surface aesthetics without context. And often the power dynamic of either a white majority or, or a majority a political or uh, social group that's in majority taking from a minority group and doing that. And so there's a power dynamic where you're, you're taking someone's culture, but how do you as a teacher explain to students, like you can't separate the two. <laughs> you can't just take someone's aesthetic and use it for your own benefit without understanding the context. And furthermore, which cultures should you or should you not take from or look at? So how do you as a teacher, or how, sorry, how do you as a maker think about that? And then how do you as a teacher kind of explain that to your students? Yeah, that's a big question, Ben Carter. <laughs> I know, I didn't put that on the list. I'm sorry, we're improvising here. <laughs> I know, totally. Well, I think I, the simple answer, the very simple answer is you don't ever take anything out of context. Everything does have context. So that's one piece. And, you know, when you're studying something, you're sort of, you know, you're going into it in, um, and, and, and part of studying something is, you know, going in and teasing apart and separating. And that's, that's a certain kind of gesture, it's a certain kind of a process and a certain kind of activity, and it has value in and of itself. Um, it allows you to maybe make links, linkages or associations, or also even filter out the noise so you can understand something else that's present. Uh, so that kind of moving in is really important, but you also have to remember to move out and include. And so I think really just not taking things out of context at all, that everything, that when we do that, we understand that we're in the study mode, we are studying and we're learning, and we are sort of on a planet. And essentially we are, as Donna Haraway says, making, you know, making kin, sometimes odd kin or unknown kin, but we're all, we are connected. We're all connected to everybody, right? So there is that. Uh, and then there's also, of course, the reality of sort of the integrity of what these historical contexts were and what they did and, and uh, keeping that intact so that it's never just floating off. So it's both things. It's, you know, it's, it's everything is together, but not everything is everything but it is together, but it's not everything, right? So it's all that movement of back and forth. But I think um, I think contents text is really significant. And then there's things like just, you know, there, there, there are things like, you know, scribing a line in clay is just, you know, if you give any kid a stick and set them, you know, out onto the beach, they start to draw, you know, a pattern or an image that there's some things that are intrinsic to being human and trying to sort of sort and associate and 
place oneself in the world that are just um you know in the body as well so it's it's very it's very complex i think that i think that there are and so a lot of it is just you know intention motivation and and how you sort of hold the integrity of what you're doing and who you're doing it with and when you're doing it in your uh, conscience you know in your heart uh in your intellect you know how do you hold that um and and that will guide you um you know and so that that's you know there's um it's making me think about this uh piece that i read to my students um this last semester and i was um uh, fortunate i think to be on co on sabbatical during covid proper when the when, so I was only teaching online for a little bit, but coming back has been um, a journey um, that's been unique. And there's this piece in Consolations by David White. I don't know if you know David White, but he's uh, someone that's um, sort of a poet and a thinker. It's the piece is called Genius. It's a book uh, of of essays, and this was what I read to them. The human body constitutes a live geography as it does the spirit and the identity that abides within it. To live one's genius, and genius is such a great word when you're talking to sophomores, <laughs> to live one's genius is to dwell easily at the crossing point where all the elements of our life and our inheritance join and make a meeting. We might think of ourselves as each like a created geography, a confluence of inherited flows. Each one of us has a unique signature inherited from our ancestors, our landscape, our language, and beneath it, a half hidden ge geology of existence, memories, hurts, triumphs, and stories in our lineage that have not yet been fully told. Each one of us is also a changing seasonal weather front. And what blows through us is made up not only of the gifts and heartbreaks of our growing, but also our ancestors and the stories continuously and unconsciously pass to us about their lives. So, you know, this is important. This is context. This is who we are today and who we need to be. This is how full we need to be today to be really present. Uh, so we can carry on. So that complexity is a gift, you know. I think it's a real gift, um, uh, and and a calling and a challenge. And and it's wonderful for them to see their teachers try to manage that and to sort of reconcile their own pedagogical upbringing with their pedagogical practices currently and to sort of think into the future about you know how it all needs to move um so it's um a challenge but it's also quite a gift too uh that that's the nature of the field uh that kind of um intense uh connection through time and integration this idea of establishing context and then uh, skewing it as an educational tool is something that I see in Darkening Ground, the show that you just recently mm. had at, at Leslie's, where you have, say, specifically the works that were ground one, ground two, and ground three, mm -hmm. which were more of a conceptual nature, but then you have objects that are not part of the conceptual part that look the same. So you can see the aesthetic link between a teapot that's in ground two and the teapot that's in the other part of the gallery that's a teapot that is literally a functional teapot that someone is going to buy. The difference is, is that in the conceptual works, context is the work. Like you are putting these objects in context and manipulating them in a way that I haven't seen you do before. So... Talk to me about specifically the piece. There's a piece that has two containers. One's a teapot, one is a, a jar, and then there are sticks, ceramic sticks that are in between the negative space of the teapot and the other jar. And I can't remember if this is ground three, maybe. I can't remember which piece this was. Yeah, that was that was ground two. I know those titles, I lament them already. <laughs> <laughs> so there was the digital print on the wall. And then there was, that was the first piece. So that was ground one. And then the ground two was the ground piece. And then the broken, uh, the teapot and the broken box was ground three. But you you sort of just 
said it. It is completely uh, about context. And when that work before it was shown at, at Farron Gallery and that show was in the docket during COVID and kept getting pushed back. So in the intermediate time, there was a uh, Fosdick Nelson Gallery wanted to do a, a faculty show with ceramic faculty, ceramic, the faculty that taught in the ceramic art division. And uh, we, I had never, I had not shown in that gallery ever since I've taught there over 20 years. Uh, coincidentally, because when I was running the division, every time a show for our division came up, I was typically forefronting the new people, as were others, right? We would we would sort of a new faculty or a Turner Teaching Fellow or sabbatical replacement. Those were the people we were giving the platform to. So this was everyone, um, our whole team, which includes our technical specialists as well. And so I had, you know, and the one thing I'm always trying to do with the students is to slow down the way they take things in, which of course is about not, uh, which is also connected to context, not just seeing what's before you, but just all that comes with it. Um, sort of like, uh, you know, I've been clean, I've been clearing this sort of weed out of the pond and you sort of take the net and you grab it and then the, all of this comes with it, you see. Um, but in uh, in thinking about that show and in thinking about putting my work in the gallery and, you know, the way you're, the students come to know you is through, you know, a very particular lens and they're, they're not so aware of the holistic package at all. And I don't, you know, I do bring students up to the house, but I tend not to, um, you know, and often to see Matthew work in the studio, which is a great uh, opportunity for them to meet and see a full-time uh, practicing potter. Um, but do, they get enough of me otherwise. So I don't typically do studio <laughs> tours in my space or anything like that. So with, but the one thing that was really in my head was this thing about, you know, context, because they're, you know, they leave home, they come to school, they have an apartment, they're, you know, doing all these classes. And I, I just looked around the studio at some point at the way things happen in there. And essentially, in all those pieces, in one way or another, through one set of situations or another, they were all just there, not tidied up and put on a, a shelf, but they were all there. So over on a table that I have a lot of just sort of drawn patterns are, I had a lot of vellum that had patterns on it that were all piled up, and that ended up being the print, right? And then I had... Um, I had, I had, when I went to Columbia with uh, Wayne Higby and the graduate students, uh, led by Andres, one of our graduate students at the time, I had a little accident. <laughs> um, and uh, when I was coming out of my room on the way to get the bus to go to the airport back, we had been there for an amazing 10 days. Um, I, I, we were in the Andes and I had my luggage and I lost my balance. And so I made a little dislocation in my foot, not eating up so good, and had to have a surgery. So I wasn't able to make work, but I was going up and down the dirt roads here on a scooter looking at the ground and what had a terrific collection of things, right? Like sticks and pieces of stuff, et cetera. So the sticks really started from that. I ended up, instead of going out and collecting them, I just made a huge pile of coils on my table and started cutting them up. And they're a particular kind of stick, right? They're a cut stick. They're not just, a, they're not like one that fell out of a tree. Um, so those were around the water pot uh, that you mentioned was, um, you know, those pots were on the ground. And I had begun also to facilitate the throwing, making coil pots. And um, and the there's a piece there called repose, which is um, it has a glaze. It's fired upside down, so the bottom is glazed, and I and it's so it's, it sort of slides. And I had filled it up with water, and I had it standing beside another container, and then I started piling these straight sticks up in between it, and it started sliding. And the more water I put in, more sticks I could put. So these are just ways of sketching and thinking and exploring the work in the studio. And I thought, you know, I just need to take these out of here like this. And so in some way, it was just like taking all of the context with it that was the generation of the pieces in the first place. Um, and, and, and the intent was to slow down the read, 
just slow it down. So when the students come up to the piece, you know, and they see that pot sitting there full of water right up to the brim so you can feel the meniscus, and then it's holding all these sticks, then it's doing something else, right? It's not so consumable. It's busy. It's engaged. It's entangled. It's caught up. It's what one needs to sort of imagine if one is a maker of pottery form anyways that goes out into the culture. That's what we're doing. And so I thought, let's just pull it all with and put it out there in the space. And this is really all of what it comes from and all of what it can do, maybe but maybe what it might do in the future, but uh, likely will be reinterpreted by somebody else. And there's something about your, they, there's a sense of play in this work and arrangement, rearrangement that seems both calculated and completely casual, which I actually think is the way people live with pots. So right. like the water pot, for instance, like my grandmother would constantly fill up little jars of water in her yard, like just collect little bits of rainwater to water the garden. And so there's a sense of sort of fun and play and casualness, but also it's in an art gallery. You've arranged it in a very specific way. There's It's lit in a specific way. So there's just something that's really fun about this really serious and really not serious together. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's a little naughty in a way. It's yeah. tempting to, you know, and it's and it was nice like the 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 uh gallerists or the students that watch the gallery had to keep the water topped off and I'm like top <laughs> that water off, make sure that pot will start sliding and then it'll crash onto the ground and that's all another piece. We'll have to make a new label, you know, but <laughs> anyways, yeah, it is. It's um it is that exactly. And, you know, when I took all the work to fair and then she continued on to, to sort of, she just, I just said, go for it, basically, just go for it. And she did a lovely, uh, this one arrangement where she took this basin and I had, I have to admit, I had set that up that way for an image where it had all these cups that were the height of the basin. And in fact, um, you know, not all of that composition not all of that composition happens at the very end and not all of it happens at the beginning either. It sort of just moves along in the process. But that piece had a, you know, a stand with a teapot that could sort of float above the basin, the wide basin and the cups. And she put it in the middle of this round table, which is where she sits with her, you know, when she's consulting with her people uh, or her, uh, and it's in the gallery uh, or her, uh, you know, people visiting the show, et cetera. And, um, so I really liked what she did with it and how she arranged it. So that was great to watch. And I also said to her, you know, just sell it however you want to sell it in groups, place it in groups, sell it individually uh, to a point. There was a point at which someone phoned up and said they wanted one cup out of one group. And I said, what would be the purpose of that? But aside from that, <laughs> you know, for the most part, it was just very sort of open uh, for her to interpret in that place. And and so I think that um, impulse, I hadn't really thought into how it was rooted in the whole conceptual development of the work in the studio, but I was pleased that that was something I felt to be, um, you know, intrinsic to what the work was and also could be how it moved into the culture. I know some of those things will move out in different ways. You know, the very first group I did, which was, I guess, was the wood grain group that that went, that stayed as a group that went to the Smithsonian that worked that way and and she phoned the they were so amazing when they were installing that show it's i think it's up still it's called this present moment and the gallerist like texted me an image of and they said oh you know we can't we just can't fit the large jar and i'm like you have to fit the large jar and i said but listen you can pile this you know put something on something push it together you know just let this be a group don't worry about it being you know, discreet, the objects being discreet. And, and she was great. She did. She, I said, it just won't be the same if you don't have that piece in there. And so she did, and it was great. And I think we both learned something about uh, just working with that. So um, in that context, because they have a much different challenge They're, you know, in Washington and it's, uh, they have to protect the work and, you know, there's a lot of concerns, but um yeah, so that's been that's been great to see how deeply that sentiment is in me. 
what an operating force it is in me too. And, and for some reason, this last couple of years has just given permission for that. I think metaphorically, it also has to do with everything we've been going on socially, that's been going on socially too. All the isolation, you know, all of the, you know, rethinking of um, everything um, that we do as a, as a culture. Within that that show, the the show with Leslie, there are different groups of objects, but there's kind of three larger things. And you talked about this in your gallery talk, um, which is display, storage, and the, I can't remember the third one. A, ser- the third? a service, storage, and display. Which are are pretty broad topics. Like you could almost say all pottery is that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. <laughs> in in the way you're handling it, though, those are somewhat specific boundaries to work within. So can you just talk about the benefit of boundaries for yourself mentally? Like how those help you in the studio when you're preparing for a show or just working through a new idea? Mm-hmm. I think, um, well, uh, it it when you... Um, bring up that question. And whenever I hear the word boundary, the first thing I think about is uh, a a statement I read by um, a videographer, Bill Viola, who said, um, boundaries, um, boundaries create friction and friction creates heat, you know? So I think that that's, you know, it's just the energy, right? It's simply the energy comes from that. And I, you know, I think when I'm in the studio, I'm not consciously, I'm not spending time establishing them, but I tend to have uh, a certain kind of, uh, I think the questions I'm asking contain a structure that begins to establish those realms, um, perhaps. Uh, but but definitely that is the case. And, and you know, and, and the other thing that was really important, I, I guess I should also say that service storage and d- display is sort of language that's always been floating around the studio, but that didn't really come together as a phrase or as a trio until, oh, I don't know, a little while ago. Um, when I was sitting down and contemplating the work, which is, you know, why one does that, you know, we can't really know what we're putting into it. So I think I naturally establish them and, and they do, you know, they just allow you to, to both be productive and have some facility to hone skills to, you know, every time I go out a new form, I have to really like embody it and it takes some time. Like, how do I move the clay? And, you know, when do I start moving it? And when do I do this? And how does this, how's this going to go in the kiln? And so there's all of that business. And those, those questions are no less profound, in fact, than anything conceptual, you know, that I don't really wait like oh this is the idea you know (laughs) and then there's the dirty work and you know it's really all integrated and I love that integration you know I just it just moves from one thing to another to another and a move that I'll make with a tool will become the whole foundation of what something you know a series of pieces and what happens on the foot for example um, so I have a lot of respect for the full breadth of the process and the intellectual rigor that's involved in all parts of it, um, the sort of physical rigor that's involved in all parts of it as well. The service storage display became, that language came because of what those words are um, conceptually to me. And that was a really big um that was really important um, because they are actually gestures in the world, which gets back to what we're talking about in terms of context. And, and in looking at the work as gestures and not just looking at them as subjects, you know, teapot, cup, basin, or looking at them also as gestures with subjects, uh, that was be- when I began to really think about, you know, well, what, what am I really doing as a maker, as a creative what am I putting into the culture, you know, as a teacher and and um, as a studio person? And um, so service, service was interesting because it's, you know, service can be really simple. It can be just sort of serving dinner to your friends. And then it's also um, very much, um, you know, about just how you are in the world, right? You can, you can, um, 
you know, how you sort of put yourself out into the world. You can do humanitarian work or, um, you know, it, it can happen on a really large scale. So all of these things can happen on a very small scale, but also a really large scale. So um, service is, is tending to, and you can tend to your friends at a kitchen table, or you can uh, put your um, efforts into um, a nonprofit, um, do humanitarian work. There's a lot of ways to do service. Um, that that got me connected to just some writing and some thinking about uh, just um, affect. And I came across a, uh, I think I remember the student I was working with at the time. And through him, he was doing, I ended up on his thesis. He did an honors thesis in uh, philosophy. And I ended up on his honor thesis, honors thesis committee, which was really a joy. Uh, intense, but a joy, um, and came across uh, this piece of writing. And the article was called Effective Labor, and it's by Michael Hart. And it was talking about affect, affective labor as immaterial labor, right? And um, it produces society. It's labor that produces society. And, and, and that really struck a chord with me in terms of doing what I do, because I'm often thinking about how the work, as we're talking, goes out into the world, how it finds its way to someone's home, which is another conversation about how work goes into a space. You know, sometimes we think that, oh, that person really liked my work. They're taking it home. And it's like, yeah, sure, they're taking it home. But you know what they're really doing? They're really taking home their own imagination. Right, they're taking their own imagination into the home of their mind is what they're doing, and so this idea of of just how this work makes society is something that's been really important to me as I've thought about what it is I'm doing, and it's really guided some of my reading, and um, you know who I'm sort of looking to to try to teach me more about what needs to happen. <laughs> you know, both in my studio and in the world. Um, so so service and then display, of course, is, you know, display is the Latin, the Latin words uh, etymology for display is scatter and disperse. And the uh, Middle English is unfurl or unfold. Um, and uh, when I think about the groups, they're sort of like that, right? They sort of, they sit, but then they sort of move, you know, if you take them into use, they sort of move, they unfurl. It's um, momentarily like a tableau vivant, maybe <laughs> one could think about them perhaps. So that's been very important. And, and that also um, led me into, you know, and it sort of led me into just thinking about other places theoretically. So Michael Hart, and then you go to um, Nicola Boriard in relational aesthetics. Um, and I think that's more commonly, more commonly students have access to that. That's That was printed, that was published in the late nineties, but it's, um, you know, again, talking about the space of um, human relations and visual culture. So that's just talking about human relations. And then he was also, I think you might remember, you know, at a certain point, Felix Gonzalez Torres was really sort of getting a lot of airtime in the art world. And um, Rikrit uh, T. Ravanit, who was doing um, performing meals in gallery spaces. So, so um, Boriard was, uh, you know, writing about uh, Boreal was writing about all of these people. So, so that, that pulled me into that, uh, bit of thinking and writing. And then earlier in 68, um, um, there's the system of objects, right? And this is another book that I keep on going back to. And that's where some of my thinking about how objects become mythological came from, you know, because he talks about when things cycle out of use, they become mythological, right? So that's an interesting to think about that idea of use and how they operate. So, so again, just for your recording, relational uh, aesthetics was Nicholas Borio, and um, and uh, the system of objects is um, Jean Baudrillard. So these French French theory. Um, and then, of course, Celine Sixou uh, and Luce Rigore, and like all of these 
uh, sort of thinkers that came out of um, French theory. And then um, from there, and most recently, I'm looking a lot at Kathleen Stewart because I have a fairly recent book of hers called Ordinary Affects. And um, she talks about sort of just the animation of things and and how um, potential is stored in ordinary things as a network of transfers and relays, you know, that 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 action happens around these things, and these things in themselves are making cultures. So it's all of the ways in which objects and things and spaces and contexts generate, um, you know, experience and meaning and culture. I, I, in in essence. So those that's, you know, some of what I've become um, interested in. And I can, you know, I'd love to, I mean, we could get focused on that and talk about that for a while. But those are certainly some of the places I have been traveling lately and trying to organize my thoughts around. I want to go back to what you said in the beginning about this idea of boundaries creates friction and that friction creates heat and that 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 is energy. So I want to talk about like, let's say the boundary of one, any of those people you just mentioned, when you read someone's book and you're engaged by their idea and you're excited, you know, you get that like kind of tingly feeling like, oh, I got to go, I got to go make something. How does that translate into you going into the actual studio, because you're translating from language to idea, then to material. But you're a mover of material, like clay is your material, not necessarily words, even though the idea might come from a word. So can you talk about how that works for you? I think that's a really good question. I think it's it's just empowering. So it doesn't necessarily translate into an object, it might translate into a um, an idea about a context, um, for sure. Um, I think that I think that this this um, you know the print that I made, where I took all of those patterns I'd used for years and composted them, uh, that was in in a way quite literal, right? It's sort of um, you know I I took all of, you know, those patterns, patterns are made from something, so they're reductive. And then those reductive patterns become compiled again, and there's no repetition left, and they become composted, and they sort of go back to an original foundation. And so in some way, um, you know, my thinking about how, you know, thinking through some of this, you know, affect and um, and labor translated into that more directly. But I think it really is primarily understanding why it matters to do this work, you know, and what it does in the culture. It's 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 as important to me as the work itself. Um, and I know that I'm working at teaching more than you know more than I'm working at the studio, you know. Um, that's actually not completely accurate, but at least half and half. And um, and and that and I understand something about what that work is. I know all the students that go through my sophomore classes are not going to work with clay, and nor will they necessarily stay in the arts. But that's not the point, is it? You know, it's something much bigger than that. Um, but I know that the work that I'm doing, um, you know, the amount of it that I make, that it's up to something when it leaves the studio. So that matters a lot. You know, it feels uh, connected to, um, you know, the world and maybe in, in some small way could change could change somebody's mind. <laughs> you know, maybe there's something concrete I could pin down out of. Uh, you know, tracking where the objects went and what they did. But at the very least, it might someone just pause and as Kath, as Kathleen Stewart, Stewart sort of talks about the ordinary and understand just what the significance of the ordinary is. I love the ordinariness of pods. I think that that's a huge power that they have is to sort of just be there. They get into all sorts of places because of that and all sorts of spaces. You know, they infiltrate at a very deep level. Well, I think also the storage pot specifically that you make, I think of being ordinary and that you're almost elevating the ordinary through them. And it's largely because we've moved away from ceramic storage as a whole. 
you know, like for the history of time, we use ceramics all the way up until, well, I mean, we use glass and we used other things, but like plastic really in the forties and fifties in a massive way started to replace sto ceramic storage vessels. So I love that you're making water pots that are clunky in form beside beautifully elegant teapots. I think most people would say, oh, this teapot is so beautiful and this water pot is so mundane. But I think you're really calling into question like, no, this is it. All of this is it. <laughs> this is all it, yeah. <laughs> I know. I mean, I do. I mean, I have to say it was those 50-pound bags of dog food that stuck at the jars. <laughs> but, but, you know, I buy, I think, you know, I buy grains now that aren't, packaged and things like that not everyone has access but we have a little health food store here that or you know that can get bulk for me but um but yes i think that's absolutely right it's it's um you know there is that and it's it's you know i those the teapots are great i'm after making this work that i just finished which is a bit larger um and and more about storage and sort of um you know, larger gestures. I'm very interested in going back to some of uh, the teapots and um, and because they're so great to use. I mean, I really love using those teapots. So, um, but I like moving between. I really appreciate moving between those realms and 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 I know there's you know some of the some of the work will simply just stay in place. You know, it will be placed and it will stay and it will and that's not a problem. You know, I think that's just fine. It's it's up to the task uh, of just being a visual object as well. And in fact, the way it sort of integrates, the way things go out of view when you consume them with your body and use them and then move back into view when you step away from them, you know, that's metaphoric. I mean, that's what we do with in relation to absolutely anything. And if we become more comfortable doing that altogether, maybe somehow that changes our wiring as we're moving in and out of relation in other ways or understanding, you know, what kin is. Uh, for example, who do we who do we care for? You know, and the the other thing I think in Michael Hart's writing, he talks about you know sort of the caring professions, right? So, um, and the word kin comes up in there, caring for kin or kin caring, which is really connected to I think some of Donna Haraway's writing where she talks about you know making odd kin, you know multi species kin making. And sort of how do we sort of, um, you know, create, you know, trouble these distinctions that we've set up um, uh, in our um, in our world so that we can all sort of all can thrive. I'd like to thank Linda for the generosity of her time. This is the first in a two-part interview, so I hope you guys will tune in next week and hear the rest where we talk about education at Alfred as well as being in a family of creatives. Before we go, I'd like to thank today's sponsors. That includes Amico Brent, the Archie Bray Foundation, and the Rosenfield Collection of Functional Ceramic Art. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor on the show, you can check us out at BrickyardNetwork.org. Also wanted to mention that the Bray is currently having their online auction to raise money for the programming, including the Brickyard Network, which this podcast is on. If you'd like to support the Bray, you can go to ArchieBray.org. I'll be back next week with another episode. Thank you all for tuning in. If you'd like more information on the artists on the show, or if you'd like more information about the workshops and events that I'll be having in the next couple months, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under Carter Pottery. Another great way to support the show is to leave me a comment on iTunes. To do that, search Tales of a Red Clay Rambler under iTunes Podcasts, and you'll find a page that's linked to our show. Thank you guys for the support. This podcast is a production of the Brickyard Network. 
an extension of the Archie Bray Foundation for the Ceramic Arts. To find out more about our lineup of ceramic podcasts, visit brickyardnetwork.org.